world. Relations were already difficult after Finland applied to join NATO, prompted by the war in Ukraine. Now Moscow has taken action against its neighbour over energy supplies. Russia's energy giant Gazprom has switched off gas deliveries. It says Finland is refusing to comply with the demand that it pay for energy in rubles. Meanwhile, the British Foreign Secretary has said she wants to see Ukraine's neighbour Moldova armed with NATO standard military equipment to guard it against potential Russian aggression. In Ukraine itself, Russian forces are intensifying their battle to capture more territory in the eastern Donbass region, and they've taken complete control of Mariupol. With more on the fate of the soldiers captured there, here's our correspondent in Ukraine, Joe Inwood. So these reports would take the total number who have surrendered and left the Azov-style steelworks to 1,730. About 80 of those, we understand, are severely wounded who were evacuated, but the rest have been taken to detention facilities in the Donetsk People's Republic. Couple of questions. What happens to them next? We've heard debates in the Russian Duma, the parliament, saying that some of them, the members of the Azov Battalion, shouldn't be treated as prisoners of war, but should be treated as war criminals. These are people that the Russian state accused of being Nazis, something which the Ukrainians deny and has been widely discredited. But it does seem that not all of them potentially will be treated according to the Geneva Conventions. That is going to pose difficult questions for anyone who remains inside. I should say we don't really have confirmed numbers of this, but it has been said that the leaders of the Azov Battalion are yet to give themselves up. Uh, the United Nations and the Red Cross, we understand, have been involved in monitoring their treatment, the situation, and the Red Cross say they are documenting the locations of these people. But what happens to them, whether they are given over in some sort of prisoner exchange with the Ukrainians, or whether some of them are put on trial for some charges as yet unknown, is going to be a really, really important question, the answer to which we'll find out in the coming days, weeks, months even. Elsewhere in the conflict, we have reports of increased shelling in the Donbass. This is the eastern region where the UK Ukrainians are holding out or defending in trenches against Russian advances. Uh, we've got reports of continued Ukrainian counter-offences uh, around Kharkiv, the city in the north uh, that they've recently repelled the Russians from. And finally, reports of Ukrainian shells destroying a, an alcohol factory inside Russian territory, killing one man, a van driver. And we are seeing increasingly these instances of the war finding itself onto Russian territory, something the people there were not really expecting and don't seem to be particularly comfortable with. And as uh, we're reporting, Russia's energy giant Gazprom has switched off gas deliveries to Finland for refusing to comply with the demand that it pay for energy in rubles. I spoke earlier to Amalinda Lindberg from the Stockholm Environment Institute, and she told us how this might affect the cost of living in Finland. Now we are approaching summer and the weather is not as cold. And Finland, uh, main energy need is actually coming during the winter season. Um, the gas supply from Russia has been mainly channeled into the heavy industry as well as the heating necessity for the household in Finland. Now, as we are approaching summer, that necessity or the demand for the heating uh, is obviously going down. And hence, that's actually giving a good opportunity for the government to prepare for the next winter to secure the energy supply for the next time. So currently, we don't see much effect or economic impact that we can tell. Uh, as obviously, has been stated as well by the Finnish government. Uh, this is mainly because uh, on top of that timing, uh, the energy mix or the portfolio of Finland has been quite diverse. Um, OK, so yeah, I was wondering how much work Finland has already done prior to, to the war in Ukraine, prior to all of this to uh, diversify where it gets its energy from, to increase its energy security. Yes, correct. I think the, uh, the diversity of the energy mix portfolio in Finland has been quite great uh, since the last decade. I think we, we can see that for, uh, forest has been one of the main key energy source. So Finland has been relying on the wood fuel from their forests, as well as the hydropower as well as the nuclear power. I think we can say that only around 20% of the total energy consumption in the 2020 is coming actually from the fossil. Amelinda Lindberg there from the Stockholm Environment Institute.